Welcome to Digital Asset News. My name is Rob, and today, just like the thumbnail and title suggests, there's some activity going on with, I feel, two of the winners, which are Cardano and Ethereum. And what I'm talking about is uh, there was an article that was recently put out which states that uh, Cardano smart contracts hit a record high as of February 2nd. So this is what we got. Last year's Vasil hard fork expanded Cardano support for smart contracts. Imagine that. A year ago, Cardano didn't even have smart contracts, and here we are. Stuck in the top 10, doing not too bad. The gains in ADA could also be tied to Cardano's recently launched stablecoin Jed. This is true. A lot of things were locked up with that. Smart contracts on Cardano are rising. There was 5,006 on February 2nd and 4,000 as of December 3rd. So you had 1,000 more programs in under two months. And that, to me, is progress. And on top of that, if we're taking a look at Cardano, uh, this is a report that Ethereum activity has picked up with the Shanghai upgrade. And if you don't know about the Shanghai upgrade, this is going to be happening in uh, mid-March. And this is all about uh, unstaking or, or giving people the ability to unstake their staked Ethereum, uh, which they did uh, a while back. And they did that uh, under the assumption that at some point they would be able to unstake it. And nobody knew when it was. So for them, I tip my hat because that was, to me, kind of a risky play. And some people have thought, well, once they are able to unstake, everybody's going to sell. It's going to be a huge, massive problem. And we're going to see the market just collapse. And other people are like, no, it probably won't do much because those people are true believers. Me personally, I, could, I couldn't care less because I dollar cost average. If everything goes down, I'm super happy because now I get to get uh, or get to purchase a lot of cheap crypto. And uh, that is what I would uh, like to do. If it goes up, well, okay, I'm in profits. But I think in the long term, because I have a horizon of uh, two or three years until we hit the next bull run, maybe four, who knows, uh, I am trying to prepare myself for everything. But it got me thinking about this, which was if we're talking about all these things about, well, there's you know a lot of activity, there's more smart contracts, then if we see more activity, we should see more our fees rising up. And there's a great website called cryptofees.info. And we can take a look here that Ethereum over the last day or so has over 4 million in fees, 4.8 in seven days. So it looks like a little bit of a pickup for sure. And then, actually, everything's up, we can see. And we take a look at Cardano. No, Cardano's not here. Oh, there it is. Cardano's way down here at $11,000. Before you start laughing, I will just say this. Cardano is a lot cheaper to use. I want to say it's around $0.09, cents, $0.10, cents, correct me in the comments section. But if you take a look at Ethereum, for every transaction that you do, this is on Y charts. And then we can just scroll over here. As of January, no, let's see here, February 4th, it was around 66 cents. And this is all denominated in US dollars. This isn't in Guay or Way or however they say it. This is in US dollars. It costs roughly 66 cents. I never really believed too much in charts, so I did it myself. I sent a test transaction, and my guess was a dollar. So again, average fee is really 66. Maybe I hit it the, at the peak time. No idea. But a dollar for every transaction that you do in Ethereum could, yeah, make a, a ton of fees up to four million dollars i suppose but then it also got me thinking about another part which was we see a lot of people talk about well everything's locked up uh, as far as like total volume locked up tbl and the best way you can find that is on DeFi llama there's a link in the description and we can see the total value locked total value locked for everything in DeFi at 58.6 billion dollars that's for everything ethereum binance cardano tron arbitrum polygon avalanche optimism I mean, everything you can think of, and they're all right here. It's only $58 billion, which sounds like a lot, but in the grand scheme of things, it's absolutely nothing. Now, if we click on just Ethereum itself, it's $34 billion. It's more than half of everything that is locked up, and that's just for now. So when we take a look at winners, so far, Ethereum is really, really crushing it. But there's this part here that confuses me. And it's here, it says, include in TVL. So it says to include the staking. So if we do that, let me click this off. Or actually, be, before I do that, let me, let me just show you this. This is stakingrewards.com, and it shows you what is being staked and the staking market cap, or how much is staked. The staking ratio is 14% out of $198 billion. So that's $28 billion is being staked in Ethereum right now. $28 billion. Remember that number. If we go back here, and I click this, because there's $34 billion right here included in staking. If I click this off, we should see what, six, seven billion? No, 
it's only 29 billion. So I'm not for sure how they calculate that. It just seems a little bit off to me. I'm sure maybe I'm not doing this uh, correctly. But if I also go back to stakingrewards.com, I do the same thing. Let's take a look at, well, oh, Cardano's number two. And I can see here the staking market, the total market cap is 13 billion. Staking, wow, 10 billion. Well, that's because they have almost 72%. Everybody's staking Cardano, everybody. You got 10 billion. So again, if I go back to DeFi Llama and I do a search and I put in Cardano, and I click on that, total value lockup is a measly $103 million. That's not too much. But again, I'm not including in the TVL the staking. So if I do that, it should rock it up by 10 billion, right? No, 23 million. So again, uh, maybe I'm not uh, seeing this correctly. We can put in pool two, it doesn't matter. Borrows, doesn't matter. And that's all we have. So that's all we have for, for that piece. Again, I think a couple of the winners for layer one solutions are definitely are what I see, Cardano and Ethereum. I still think there's a lot of runway for that. That's why I dollar cross average into uh, Avalanche, into uh, Cosmos, into Polkadot. I think there's another couple. can't remember right now. But uh, again, on this channel, you have to understand, I'm super biased. I only talk about the things that I have invested into. So if you're wondering, does Rob invest into that? He sure does talk about it a lot. Yes, yes, I do. So let me know what you think about that in the comment section. And let's move on to an interesting piece about FTX. I, this one, it, it, makes me, it makes me laugh because it's just, everybody's just, you know, you go to the lowest volume, the, the, the lowest value denominator uh, to what you want to do. So the FTX wants politicians and PACs to return donations and may sue to recover funds. Isn't that the whole point of a donation? Like, I'm going to donate this to you. So here you go. Use this for President Joe Biden so you can actually, you know, win the presidency. Now we get, now give him that money back. Amazing. Here's what we got. FTX newly appointed CEO, John, 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 J, that can't be his name, right? John, John, John J. Ray the third. Contra contributions or other payments, he states, will be returned by February 28th. And he's talking to all the politicians. Echoing a previous warning that the company would go after funds not returned voluntarily through legal means with interest accruing from the date any action is commenced. So all those funds that they gave him, which was roughly $93 million, like give it back to us. We don't care if you spend it or not. We want it back. The FTX debtors are sending confidential messages to political figures, political action funds, other recipients of contributions, other payments. This is where it gets pretty dank. Recipients who have donated funds connected to FTX to charities are not off the hook. And that company will still seek to recover the money regardless. I find this fascinating. Like, oh, you gave that to a charity to help homeless children or to help, you know, some kind of sanctuary. Well, tough. Give us that money back because that's what we want. On the other side of that, you have to think about all the people who lost all their funds. And of course, I'm sure they'd like that money back. But again, you got to do that for everybody. That's for the dirty politicians and then for the people who give the charities and everything in between. Let me know what you think about that in the comments. And then also, not to leave any our friends Celsius, but uh, this was a good piece from Pete No Stop. And Celsius and Voyager, matter of fact, hired this law firm Kirkland and Ellis. And there was a nice, nice little article above the law. A look inside Kirkland Ellis Partners new 38 million Malibu mansion. Very nice. So if you're wondering where all your funds went to, there you go. And I'm just going to tell you like this. Nobody wins in chapter 11. And I'm going to call for it right now. Liquidate everything. Return as much funds as you can back. Because every single day, week and month, that we stick ourselves in this chapter 11, the less we're going to get back. Because the only winners are going to be the people who used to run this company as they do the clawbacks and the lawyers. That's why I say liquidate, give as much back. I will know what to do with it better than you and your stupid reorganization of a company. Anyhow, that's what we have. Let me know. And then to finish up, I thought it was interesting. NFTs are already here or coming to Bitcoin. And it's a, it's a big argument that that's always been coming along about as far as like uh, the Bitcoin maximalist and the purist. And they say, well, Bitcoin is this. And we can build on top of Bitcoin. And we can do all these things. Well, hold on. Not so much. So the launch of Ordinals, which is an NFT protocol, is on the Bitcoin blockchain. It's coming out. 
Ordinal is a protocol that assigns trackable serial numbers to Satoshis. These Satoshis can then be added to digital assets like video or audio. And people are like, no, we don't want to do this. The criticism is that it's potential to abuse the network and populate its block size with financially irrelevant storage. The argument against onboarding dates back to 2010 when a proposal to implement a domain name system was rejected by Satoshi, the Satoshi, the Satoshi, and a number of other core developers. Satoshi said this, piling every proof of work quorum system into one data set doesn't scale. In reference to the potential memory usage, he added that users shouldn't have to download all or of both to use one or the other. So there's always been this thing about, well, Bitcoin is the, is the most securest platform on the planet. It has the most computational power because we're using so much to mine Bitcoin. And all the Bitcoin maxis would always talk about, we're just going to build on top of that and scale up. I just, maybe this isn't what they were talking about. I'm not sure. But they're like, no to NFTs. However, I found this interesting. Not everybody. Somebody, uh, a gentleman by the name of Dan Held. He's got a YouTube channel. Check him out. He's been around forever. He's a crypto Bitcoin OG. He says, this will drive the demand for block space and bring more financial use cases to Bitcoin. And also will get a, you know, the meme coins to people or dog coins like, hey, this might be something good for NFTs. That's what we have. Not really convinced on this one. And then lastly, you're going to see these articles pop up and they're going to really start to question yourself about investing in the crypto. I know some people will look at this and start laughing and go, ah, oh, that's Jim Cramer. He doesn't know what he's talking about. But you understand, uh, people outside of crypto, they really like Jim Cramer for some reason. And they love watching his show, does you know recent de decent ratings. And when he tells them about how bad crypto is, it just leads itself to people just closing their minds down. So if you're new to crypto, I just want to explain to you this. Jim Cramer probably was a great whatever, but he's made so many bad calls as time has gone on. You just have to question yourself is like, does this person really know exactly what crypto and all it is? He's already invested in the crypto before. He used crypto, he sold it, paid off his house, and now he's like, it's the most awful thing of all time, and you should never get into it. Kind of reminds me of what Kevin O'Leary did. He says, you know, up to 2019, he was saying, Bitcoin is the, is the worst, dumbest thing, and no one would ever get into it. On the flip side, and he admitted this on Squawk Box, he was actually buying it in 2018. Anyhow, so here's what we have as far as the article itself. Very quickly, Jim says, I wouldn't touch crypto in a million years, which is pretty funny because in December, he said, everybody get out now. And we just saw like a 50% rise. So whatever. And what he's talking about, he goes, there's a bailout loan from the federal home loan bank for a crypto bank to stem the run. And what he's talking about is this. The outcry, so you don't get twisted. The outcry comes after Silvergate Capital Corporation, a California-based bank that provides financial services to the digital asset industry, sought a $4.3 billion loan to make it through the crisis of confidence across the crypto ecosystem late last year. I don't see a problem with this. I mean, it's been a pretty rough year, year and a half, actually. So when we have somebody that comes out and says that it actually is still solvent and still making things, Hey, they just need a little bit of help. But the thing about this article is this. You look at a guy like Kramer, and he seems so sure of himself. I mean, so sure. And when he's talking about these things, he's like, I'm 100% sure. There is nothing against me and my thought process. Well, just remember this, that during the financial collapse, this was him. This is 27 seconds. Listen to what he says about Bear Stearns, which was insolvent and actually later went down and was only rescued by J.P. Morgan Chase. Take a listen to this. A great job. I am. <laughs> okay. Peter writes, should I be worried about Bear Stearns in terms of liquidity and get my money out of there? No, no, no. Bear Stearns is fine. Do not take your money. Out. This is really, look, if there's one takeaway other than a plus 400 something, Bear Stearns is not in trouble. I mean, if anything, they're more likely to be taken over. Don't move your money from Bear. That's just being silly. Sure wasn't silly as they just collapsed. And then, of course, this was actually an article of follow-up 10 years later. And it just talked about how <laughs> Jamie Dimon, the CEO of JP Morgan, actually regretted the decision to kind of bail them out as they became insolvent. I just think it's interesting just how, how sure of a person's self that they can be.
but they're like, yeah, you got to do this. You got to do this. You got to do this. And then it becomes the exact opposite. So that goes for me too. If you think like at some point, like I'm a hundred percent sure you need to question me and be like, even though Rob is hundred percent sure, does he really know? Here's a, here's a tip. Nobody knows. Nobody. Anyhow, to finish this all up, a little quick article, Binance launches a tax tool for crypto traders in France and Canada. That's great for everybody, all the Canadians and uh, French residents. You guys have a tax tool. Now for the rest of us, there's this thing above my head. It's called Coin Ledger, And it's what I used two years straight. They are a sponsor of the channel. If you hate using affiliate links, don't use it. I mean, you get like 20% off, I think. But if you don't, if you hate my affiliate links, just go to coinledger.io and you can sign up for free right now. And you can just take a look at like a cost-based analysis. You don't have to pay for everything. But if you do decide to use it for your taxes, and I'm telling you, it's super simple. From the time that I started this up, to actually put all my taxes in. It takes me 30 minutes as an API integration into my MetaMask wallet, to all my centralized exchanges, to my DeFi, all the stupid NFTs that uh, I bought for some stupid reason. It's got everything. And it puts it all in there and says, this is what you have, this is how much you owe. Great job, do better next year. And I just ship it over my CPA and off I go. So uh, if you just wanna see how that works, you can sign up for free. There's a link in the description. It's very simple, it looks something like this. And there's actually a video on how to use it. And that is it. So look, that is it for today. If uh, you like today's video, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing. A lot of things to talk about are time sensitive. But that is it for this show. So thanks so much for stopping by. I do appreciate it. And I'll see you on the next one.